couple of weeks ago, we asked you when you experience transcendence and you responded in a variety of beautiful ways. A number of us said that when we're out in the night sky, we can really feel that we're experiencing transcendence or in nature and people named particular places that they love, the forest, the ocean, sunrise. People also named situations that they're in or activities where they feel the transcendent. Some people said reading about astronomy or physics or math, poetry can take people to transcendence. And people said relationships with loved ones, whether they're people or cats or dogs, birds, turtles. In that relationship, people experience the transcendence. So overall, what we all were describing was when we feel that we're part of something bigger than ourselves. I like to think of those moments of transcendence coming to us through angels. Traditionally in scripture, angels always announce themselves by saying, be not afraid. And in a way, when we feel under the night sky, the awe of the space and time and our tiny place in the world, don't we have a sense of, be not afraid, the universe is vast. When we're in the ocean being held up by that vast body of water that connects all the continents around our planet, don't we feel a voice saying, be not afraid, the planet is vast. When we're in a relationship with somebody and we feel their care for us, or we feel the vast web of learning because we're in some new area we've never thought about before that we couldn't have gotten to alone, but in this relationship we've gotten there, don't we in a way feel, be not afraid, there are so many ideas you have yet to think of. I must admit, I probably have a somewhat skewed version of what angels are, and it all goes back to an experience when I was a kid in Charleston, West Virginia. I grew up in a tiny Unitarian fellowship, Unitarian Universalist fellowship in Charleston, West Virginia. There was no minister. It was, you know, just the families who showed up and programmed for each other and actually built the church and ran the programs and there were no staff people. It was all done by volunteers. And I loved that place. It was totally home for me. When I was a kid, we were learning this curriculum called How Miracles Abound. And we spent our time watching nature for miracles. So we would watch little eggs in an incubator. We would watch them, oh my gosh, they're hatching. You know, we would watch snakes shed their skins or, or movies of snakes shedding their skins. We would watch tadpoles turning into frogs or chrysalis turning into butterflies. It was all very naturally centered. In the woods outside my house in West Virginia, I also was always watching how nature was amazing. And so life went on until we had a state representative in our congregation and he came one day and said, oh no, there's a new law in Congress that they're not gonna allow any reptiles in religious institutions anymore. Now, there were two groups of people who this impacted. One was our tiny fellowship, looking at snakes shedding their skins and turtles laying their eggs and, and you know, other reptiles that we were watching. But nobody really knew about us. There were, you know, 30 of us. The people that this legislation was directed at were a different kind of West Virginians who had reptiles in their congregations. They were the snake handlers. The snake handlers, you know, would bring the serpents into the services and they would handle them because of some scriptural reference that said that if you're holy, even being bit by a poisonous snake, you won't be hurt. And so they would have these snakes in the West Virginia congregations, up in the hills primarily. And as it happened, a child got bit and actually died. So this bill was introduced and we found out about it in my little congregation and we got busy. We wrote letters. This was my first legislative advocacy campaign. We wrote letters. We went as families and talked to legislators about how miraculous it was to watch snakes shed their skins or turtles lay eggs. 
We did all of this. And meanwhile, up in the hills, the minister of the snake handling congregation, the one where the girl had died, prayed upon, P-R-A-Y, prayed upon the notion that this bill was coming and asked God what to do about it. And God said, be not afraid because angels will deliver you from this bill. And so it became that my congregation of hyper-rational, mostly scientists, mostly people who worked at Union Carbide or DuPont doing scientific research and their families, were seen by this congregation in the hills as angels sent by God. And so when the legislation got thrown out, my congregation said, well, our hard work paid off. And the congregation in the hills said, angels delivered us just as God promised. And so they invited us up for every year a feast and a dance to celebrate this deliverance, this angelic quality that they saw in my congregation. Now, I have to say, the people in my congregation did not think of themselves as angels any more than they thought of their dog as a unicorn. These were hyper-rational people for whom the notion of being an angel of the Lord was kind of a bizarre joke, to tell you the truth. But to the people in the hills, my congregation was angels. And so at that point, and I was a kid, I started to see how complicated this business was of interpreting messages that come to us. And I also began to look around with a very different eye on the world, looking for angels. Who might deliver me? Perhaps the kid who asked the question that distracted the teacher so we didn't have a quiz that day when I hadn't prepared, perhaps it was an angel. I started to look at the world very differently at that point. And so as we explore this topic of transcendence, what we're really exploring a lot of the time is how we each attempt to describe the indescribable. How we each attempt to point to the edge over which we can't really go. How far we can go with different understandings. And the thing is, Who's to say what's right? Who's to say that the people in the hills who prayed weren't given a clear message from God? A God you or I might not know or believe in, but somehow they knew. And while my congregation was working hard, they were celebrating and trusting and resting. Who's to say we were right and they were wrong? We were rational and they were irrational. So as we explore each of our experiences of the transcendent, what I love thinking about is really how complicated it is. As Joanna said, how much there is a sense of humor built into the universe. I think it's easy to be embarrassed by the particularity to which we are drawn to describe the transcendent because we're always humbled by our inadequacy to do it. No metaphor, no poem, no matter how great, no painting can really point to the complexity and the beauty of it all. And so here we are on earth, angels for each other, I think. I see each of you bringing a message to me, be not afraid, week after week as we gather, as you comfort me and one another through difficult times, as you celebrate and sing and see life's beauty, as you do something new and brave as you work for justice. You're giving me messages of what goes beyond my life, my tiny little life. And you're saying to me, as we all say to each other in so many ways every day, be not afraid. <laughs>